Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Is it this thing on? Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night? Amen. Come on, we went through the work day. We're halfway through the week. Somebody's spirits get a little higher when they come into the house of God. Amen. Faith is in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. I can't help but get excited coming to the house of the Lord. Got a, got a good looking crowd tonight. Amen. You're here and the Lord's here. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to uh, take up, we're going to have prayer now. And uh, we've had several different texts today go through. A lot of people battling cancer, it seems like. A lot of people battling sicknesses. And man, it's, it feels like I, every time we're up here praying, it's, we've got sicknesses going around. It's like we can't get over it. But I believe that the Lord can take it away. That, as a wave, it'll just, out of this whole community, it'll just get out of here. Amen. Uh, if you've got a need, let it be made, made known by the uplifting of your hand and speak it out. Call on the name of Jesus. And let's see some miracles happen. Lord, God, I thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. God, I can't help but be so thankful being in the house of the Lord. And God, and I can thank you time and time again for everything that you've done. All the healings, all the miracles, all the signs and the wonders, God. And I got a few more to ask of you tonight. God, all these sicknesses, everybody battling cancer. Lord, I pray for Brother Donnie. I pray for all these other needs that we're, we've been texting about. Lord, so many people got problems in their body and, and just diseases and sicknesses and cold and flu and so many different things. I, I pray for Brother Skipper, Lord. I pray that you're in that hospital room with him, wherever he's at. Lord, I pray that you touch his body, that you heal it in the name of Jesus. I pray that you strengthen everybody's body or every elderly person that needs strength in their body. I pray that you strengthen them, Lord. Let them, let them do what you want them to do. Let them be able to get back to the house of the Lord. God, because we are better when we're here together. Lord, I pray that we can, as a, as a wave, Lord, that you'll just let that sickness get out of this whole community, Lord, this whole county, everybody battling sicknesses, that it'll just get out of here in the name of Jesus. I pray for freedom to be in this service tonight, Lord, that everybody will leave this place uplifted. Let faith rise in this place, Lord, let our spirits be uplifted. Lord, things are not as bad as it seems, and, and the devil tries to make it seem like things are bad and that our world's crashing down. But God, I just pray that you'll just lift us up tonight. Lord, if nothing else, let us praise and worship and let us just come, come together the only way that we can. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. Oh, 
he loves me that much. He loves you that much. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. Amen. You can go, be, go ahead and be seated. If you're praying, just keep on praying. Amen. That's how we're going to see revival. Through prayer. That's how we're going to see healings. Through prayer. That's how we're going to see testimonies and more testimonies. Through prayer. Amen. Prayer is the key. I was uh, teaching the youth Sunday too because I just have a, a burden all of a sudden that we've got to pray. You know, it's impossible for me. I don't know if it's a scientific fact or not, but for me, it's impossible to be depressed and be thankful. Brother Ronnie, I was teaching them how to pray. Because how many of us have just said, I, I don't know how to pray. I don't know where to begin. But if we're going to see anything, if we're going to see our family come back, we're going to have to start praying. A praying church is going to see revival. If we want to see, you know, all these miracles that we keep praying for, people being healed of cancer, because he can do it. It's going to take more than a little 10-second patty cake and pray at church. But we're going to have to set aside time and build an altar. But it's impossible to be depressed and, and continue to be wallowing in self-pity and doubt when you're thankful. And I told the, the youth, I said, you know what, number one thing I can tell you about prayer is I said, there's so many different avenues. The Bible teaches you about prayer. There's prayer plans, so many things, but you can't ever go wrong, Brother Terrence, just beginning to pray and be thankful. I said, as far as the littlest thing, when you wake up that morning, you say, I'm thankful for this. Thankful that you woke me up, God. Thankful that I had a house. Thankful that I had a roof over my head. Thankful that I woke up not hungry. Thankful that I have uh, running water when I wake up. Thankful that I have a job to go to. Thankful that I got school. Thankful that I got friends. Thankful that I got a family. Thankful that I got a healthy family. Thankful that I got this. You can just, once you start that, once you start that, Sister Crystal, all the depression gets out of the way. Everything that was there, it's gone. Because you just killed it. You just got it out of your life because you're thankful. And I said, before you know it, you can go from not feeling spiritual, you can go from not feeling nothing, to feeling so mighty that you feel like you could storm hell with just a bucket of water. All by just being thankful. Amen. I don't ever want to not be thankful. Amen. God is good. We've got several different ways to give tonight. We've got GiveLify, PayPal is available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be made to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, 
New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. These two pans here closest to the pulpit are the tithing, and the two outer pans are for your offering. And if you will, let's stand as we pray this declaration. Amen. This, is, this right here is a prayer we could pray. Amen. Write this, write this down. Take it with you. Pray it not just at church. Amen. Claim it over your family. Claim it over your finances. Claim it over your health. Amen. Let's say it with faith. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus name. Amen.
and clap just a little louder, just a little longer. Amen. Come on, his love never runs out. It never fails. Man, I'm so thankful for my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. If the children's church kids and the young people will all just go ahead and come line up here. Amen. Got a good looking group of them also. I think we're in the middle of revival. Amen. I think we're seeing it. And we ain't seen nothing yet, Brother Blake. Hallelujah. I kind of want to keep that same faith level as we pray over these young people and these children too. I want to pray. I want to pray for their future. I, I want us to be thankful for what they're going to do. Amen. So if you believe that with me, let's stretch forth our hands and let's start thanking the Lord for what's going to happen to these young people. Lord, I want to thank you right now, God, because I believe that some things are going to happen in these children's and these young people's lives, God, that we can't even expand, can't even think about to see. Lord, I just, I'm thankful for the, the ministers that are going to rise up. I'm thankful for the prayer warriors that are going to rise up. I'm thankful for the teachers, Lord, that are going to rise up. I'm thankful for the callings that they're going to answer on their life. I'm thankful for the level of faith that is going to be instilled in their hearts and in their minds. I'm thankful for that seed that's going to be planted starting tonight even. Lord, for the songs that they're going to never forget. For the words that they're going to hear their teachers say that they're never going to lose sight of. God, they're going to remember that on a Wednesday night, God, they're going to remember that that lesson that Sister Casey or Brother Blake or, or Brother Richard or whoever it was that taught it, they're going to remember it and they're going to hold on to it. Lord, and they're going to see great things. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the revival that we're going to see. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Braxton, go ahead and lead them on back. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and clap our hands to the Lord one more time as Pastor comes up here to teach. This Wednesday, it's been like in the 60s in February. We ought to be thrilled to death, especially all of our Eskimos. Amen. I hope you're glad to be here tonight. I am. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to see you. And uh, we're going to get into the word of the Lord real quickly. And... Uh, Got a lot to talk about tonight. Glad to see everybody here. See some that weren't here this weekend. And uh, so we're glad that you're here tonight. And uh, we're going to keep learning about growing in the Lord. And uh, we're going to um, hopefully unpack some brand new stuff tonight. I hope we do. Uh, but we'll wait on you to get your handouts. Thank you, brother. Um, please do be praying for the sick. I want to remind you, the, Brother Donnie has not been staying away because he's been sick. He's staying away because the doctor told him to with all the sickness and stuff that's going around. But he will start his second round of chemotherapy on Monday, and uh, he's going to need our prayer. Really ramp it up next week. Because he did have a lot of struggles through the first week. He'll carry this pump for five days. And, um, and God willing, that'll be it. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what we believe. But uh, Brother Skipper is in the hospital, as already been mentioned. Um, and uh, we do have several people with the flu. And, and, and I, I don't know all of it. COVID and stomach virus and... And flu, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it's just crazy. Everybody's just been really going through it. And uh, if it's missed you, be thankful. Uh, and uh, But please be praying for the sick. Uh, did we have enough? Good, good. If you recall... A couple, three weeks ago, we taught you that 
it's a waste of time to try to grow and mature by living according to the law rather than in grace. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, I hope you do. Uh, the reason is the law is performance-based. And it's weak in that it requires flesh to police flesh. And that leads to Phariseeism. And Phariseeism, <clears throat> even though the Pharisees were not the only faction, there were the Sadducees that mentioned in the Bible and the Essenes as well, but Phariseeism is competition and fighting, divisions and factions based solely upon how much more closely I follow the law than you do. Are y'all with me now? Yeah. I need to give us a few more minutes to get settled in. If I follow the law better than you, then I am better than you under the law. Uh, divisions and factions. I, I heard just in the last couple of days of two churches in a community next to, near to us that have divided and, and now started four congregations. That's what happens when you try to live by the law. Okay? We use the law as a measuring stick. And when I say the law, I'm talking about rules and regulations. We use them as a measuring stick, primarily our ability to adhere to the law. Because when we live to the law, we learn that you never come to the end of yourself. Because as long as there's more you can do, you feel like there's, if I work harder, if I pray harder, if I fast more, if I do more, just give me some time and I will become what I'm supposed to become. I can do it. Can I get an amen? That's what we do. I can do that. I, I can just give me a little bit more rules and I'll check them off and I can get there. When we realized that that wasn't true, that you can't be good enough, you can't do enough, you can't work hard enough, when we realized that it wasn't true, many of us quit. Now I say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I do because I have done some research and I have spoke about this before, but we kept one soul in this church from 1988 to 2010 that wasn't raised in the church. One soul that came from the world to live for God in 22 years. We kept one. And it was by and large because we had many receive the Holy Ghost. That one was Sister Maria, by the way. She's still here, thank God. But uh, uh, we had many filled with the Holy Ghost. But when you realize you can't be good enough, they quit. While the remainder of us became satisfied to just be good enough. But because I didn't quit, I was better than them that did. Am I making sense? The truth is, I never found completion in performance either. But because I stayed, I was better than those who left. And that's going to have to be good enough. Over the last several weeks, I guess it's gone into months now, I have learned that I have a whole lot more to learn about the Lord. And I've also learned that I have much more to do for God than I have done. And it has been a blessing to learn these things. I feel better and better the closer I come to the end of myself. You see, in our last few lessons, I found out God is for me, not against me. I said I found out God is for me and not against me. I thought I had to prove myself for him to love me. I'm just being frank with you. Matter of fact, Sister Kelly, I prayed that way. Lord, if you'll give me one more chance, I'll prove to you that I'm in it to win it. 
but it never did work. I found out that he can use my failures as part of my perfecting process if I'll just give them to him. I've had to repent recently for trying so hard, singing, preaching, and praying harder and louder because I got so wrapped up in my performance that I couldn't hear the voice of the Lord as he was trying to direct me and adjust me. Now, I want to be very clear in what I'm about to say. Nothing I say is an indictment against those that came before us. I have been very clear as to my feelings toward our heritage. They taught us to pray. They taught us to trust God. They taught us to be faithful. And they lived what they taught us. We drink from wells we didn't dig. We eat from vineyards we didn't plant. We live in houses, and I'm speaking spiritually. And we have this church now as a vehicle whereby we can all be perfected. Who is we all? Have y'all been listening to what I taught you over the last several weeks? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 40 says, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Our forefathers, as close as you want to count, are counting on us to stick this out. And not just stick it out, but to triumph and come to a place of completion, come to a place of fulfillment. That's why they trusted us with the church. That's what they prayed for. That's what they fasted for. We have this vehicle because of those that have gone before us. Sister Meredith texted me this week about something unrelated, but it's a quote that I often use that Sir Isaac Newton gave us, and he said, if I can see far, it's only because of the giants upon whose shoulders I stand. I echo those sentiments. But that doesn't... Excuse the fact that we didn't have it all right. We don't have it all right now, but I hope we're on our way. But as much as we've talked about grace and the way the law didn't work, the truth is we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the law. Now, the law that we refer to in the Bible does anybody want to tell me how it's broken down? Do you know? Obviously, what would you think of first when we're talking about the law? Ten commandments. Very good. Those were the first ten. Okay? They begin with, thou shalt have no other God before me, and, and don't make any graven images, and, and don't use the Lord's name in vain, and honor your father and mother, and thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, etc., all right, but in the Jewish Mosaic law, there are a total of 613 different laws that they had to follow. And if you're reading the bread right now, you're getting into that in Leviticus, right? Okay, some of it we saw in Exodus, you're getting into Leviticus. But I want to say that as futile as it is to try to be perfected by the law, you wouldn't be where you're at without the law. You would not be here where we're at without the law of God guiding us. I'm going to prove that to you. Let's go back to the beginning. At the close of his life, his ministry and his leadership, Moses gave the children of Israel a retelling of the law. Okay? Does anybody know what book of the Bible that is? Anybody? It literally means retelling. Deuteronomy. Okay? That is a retelling of the law that was given to him. The children of Israel, when they got this book, were on the threshold of entering into the promised land. But the work wasn't finished because the people that possessed the promised land were not going to lay down and let them just come take it from them. There were still battles to fight and enemies to destroy before they could take the promised land. How would they know what to do when they got there? How would they know to discern between righteousness and sin? 
How do we know what the will of God is? In spite of our feelings, circumstances, culture, cultural and societal mores, how do we know what God wants? By the law, by what he's given, by the word that he's given. Deuteronomy 6.24 says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. Remember 613 laws. To fear the Lord our God. Look at that next part. For our good always. That he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. That principle remained throughout the ministry of the New Testament. The will of God had to be obeyed. We cannot decide that the tenets and principles of the law no longer apply to us because of grace. We cannot say there are no longer any standards of behavior because of grace. He told us, Brother Terrence, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what's the book say? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? All right? But the law is essential. We're going to just stay with me. Now, some of the, the rules you're going to read about, and if you get leprosy, you've got to hold a turtle dove under running water, and y'all know what I'm talking about? Those don't even apply to us because they're not even practical. Okay, leprosy's not even a deal today unless you're an armadillo. So some of those laws are not practical to us or are not applicable to us in a practical way. And it's very, this is very important. The civil laws that are given to the children of Israel and the ceremonial laws that were given to the children of Israel are not applicable to us. And they don't even make sense in our culture for the most part. But the moral aspect of the law is applicable from the day they went to the garden until the day the Lord comes. The moral tenets and the moral principles of the law, but with that being said, all of the principles of the law, the reason for the law, they still remain today. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Well, what do you think he meant by that? The law had a purpose. The reason he gave them those laws were a purpose, which by and large were so you know how to behave. There's a lot more to it than that, but if you wanted to summarize it, that's what they were, so you know how to behave. Now, the Apostle Paul, and I don't have time to go into his story, but before the road to Damascus, he was a champion of the law. The reason why he turned on the Christian movement, or the way as he called it, was because he felt like they were violating the law of God. The things that Paul did up through and including uh, 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 giving his approval to the death of Stephen, all of that, that was all done because Paul thought he was the champion of the law of God. But it also appears that he continued to be a champion of the law of God after being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And here's what happened. Paul got a new perspective of the law. Rather than complete observation of the law being the measure and stick of perfection, he found a new measure and stick of perfection. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody have an idea what is our measuring stick of perfection? Jesus Christ, very good. Paul found that the measuring stick is Jesus Christ who made the purpose of the law very clear in how he lived his life and how he treated others. The law was what was given the children of Israel that was to lead them back to the restoration of relationship. But it couldn't. Why? Why couldn't it? 
Why could, remember Adam and Eve? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute and I'm just going to talk to you for a minute. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They disobeyed God and they sinned and they got kicked out and man was separated from God, right? Right? So the law basically was the will of God revealed. This is how I want you to live. But it, messed, it, it got all messed up. Why? Not just disobedience, but it got messed up because it was fleshly driven. Or performance driven. And it fostered two camps. Those that were holy moly and those that were nothing. And it creates a sense and an attitude of self-righteousness and self-exaltation. And ladies and gentlemen, we're not immune to that. But we got to find a way to get delivered from it. Because... I mean, this ain't my first time around the road and, and I'm not as wet behind the ears as I used to be. And I know that, that that Pharisee, what he said about that publican, which was, I thank the Lord I ain't like him. Now, Sister Maria, I don't know that any of us are, please forgive me, dumb enough to say that, but I promise you we've thought it. I promise you that somebody has come alongside of you and you have thought, boy, I'm glad I ain't like them. I ain't perfect, but I ain't like them. It did feel kind of good. And that was the problem with the law because I feel Jesus moving in here because I could say, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, and I don't do this. But I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and you don't. So I'm better than you. It's what it fosters. Okay? That's why the law didn't work. Now, Paul wrote his letters to Galatia, which is the book of Galatians. It wasn't written to just an individual place necessarily, but perhaps a, a region of churches. And they were in a dilemma regarding the complete observation of the law, they were being pressured by and large by people who had no relationship with God beyond the law. You understand what, that, what I mean by that? They had no relationship with God except we do everything he says. We don't know him. We don't love like him. We don't live like him, but we follow the rules. They begin to pressure these spirit-filled Galatians and make them follow every detail of the law. Do you want to know why? Anybody have a guess? They had to find out if they were as good as them or not, if they were worth being around or not. They had to create a system of measurement whereby they could decide if they're true Christians or not. Is everybody all right? Galatians 3 and 24. Now, Paul was telling them very clearly in the book of Galatians, and you'll read it later, following the law by itself gets you nothing. Ah, come on now. Say, what well, What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that they can follow the law every, every dot, every I, and cross every T, but on the day of atonement, they still got to trust that the high priest is going to get the right sacrifice in there and take care of things. Doing the law, following the tenets of the law did not mean that you were perfect or complete. You still had to trust the high priest to go in the holy of holies and make atonement for you. So, Galatians 3 and 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. I looked that word schoolmaster up. It's not one we use anymore. I got to be honest with you, and I don't even, I'm not even sure that's what he was, but when I think about schoolmaster, I picture 
Ichabod Crane. Anybody remember him? That's, that's who I picture, schoolmaster. In my mind, I picture Ichabod Crane. I'm sorry to poor old Ichabod if that's not fair, but that's what I picture. Because when you learn what it is, it was a legally appointed overseer authorized to train up a child by administering discipline, chastisement, and instruction. But here's the part of the definition I want you to get. This schoolmaster was to do whatever was necessary in the life of that child to promote development. To position that child to be able to become. And he said that's what the law was. Is everybody with me? That's what the law was to position us to become what we were supposed to be. Which to bring us to Jesus Christ. To know him in the power of his spirit. To become conduits. That's what the law was designed to do is to bring us to a place where we would become conduits between heaven and earth. Whereby the spirit could flow through us. And whosoever will might believe on him, surrender their lives to him, and also walk in the newness of life. That's our purpose, because that was Jesus' purpose, right? Reconciliation, bringing people back. The issue was that back then they didn't really know how to apply the law or what the purpose of the law actually was. Their end game was obey more than 613 rules than the dude next to me. Does that make sense? What else did they have, Brother Terrence? What else did they have? Okay. In their mind, the law became an avenue whereby they could proclaim their own holiness and their own devotion to God and others, failing to understand that we aren't holy by what we do, we're holy by who he is. So let's go to Romans this is some cool stuff we're about to get into. And we'll, then we'll bring it home, maybe. Because I'm going somewhere with this. I know this has been a little muddy, but I'm going somewhere with this. But we, we all know exactly what was going on. And, and, and forgive me for being carnal. Forgive me for being carnal. All right, but I think you'll understand this. You ever watch Little House on the Prairie? Nelly? Pharisee. <laughs> now y'all got it. It's clicking. Huh? Everybody's like, oh. <laughs> that little girl can make you so mad. Tattletale, prissy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's what that's what that measuring stick of the law turns you into. It turns you into judging everybody. Why am I judging them? I got to make sure I'm past them. I got to make sure I'm better than them. There was no concept about a relationship with God. It was all based on competition one between another. Okay, so let's go to Romans. So we've talked about how ugly the law could be, but look what Paul says. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I wouldn't have known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said Thou shalt not covet. So here's what the law did. It said you can eat of every tree in the garden but this one. That's what the law said. Adam and Eve didn't know the tree was off limits until God said you can't eat of it. The law teaches us right from wrong. And I shared this with Miss Jane this morning. 
but you can do some research and see that the large majority of the U.S. Constitution and other countries' constitutions or, or ruling documents has its roots in the law of the Bible. You can find it. You can look it up yourself. There have to be standards that law-abiding people do and law-breaking people have to adjust themselves to. Why is that? The Bible says the law is not for the law-breaker. I mean, for the law-abider, but the law-breaker. Okay, look here. Without lines on the road, you have chaos. Why do you think? Sister Miss School Marm Crystal. Try it. You just sit in your chair tomorrow and you tell the kids, there's a door, y'all get a drink. And watch what happens. <laughs> they'll push and they'll shove they'll stomp on one another one of them will go to the water fountain down there one of them will go to the water fountain over there one of them will just decide you, got, you took too long and shove them out of the way so what does teacher do <laughs> y'all get in a line you line them and you, you provide order you provide some standards Tell them to go to the lunchroom. Y'all go eat. I'll be see you back here in an hour. Them kids will be standing on the tables, throwing food at one another, robbing the fridge, right? Yeah. Don't like what they got today. We'll go back there and find you something else. Why don't we do that? Really, why don't we do that? Why don't you tell, here we go, why don't you tell your four-year-old You hungry? Go cook something. We all, Lacey, we all have standards to live by. You go to your work. Tell them, I ain't working back here today. I'm checking up front. Well, that's not so. I do what I want to. There's no standards. You see what I'm saying? Y'all get out there and just start driving 100 on your way home. All of you, except two or three little old grandmas, Miss Daisies, that want to drive 15. But you know why? They have, think of, think, I'm, I'm trying to prove a point to you. Without boundaries and standards and some rules, you have chaos. Chaos. You could ask, 50 kids in the third grade. How many of y'all want to quit school today? I bet 49 of them say, peace out. <laughs> Why don't we allow that? They ain't got the sense to make that decision. So I hope that makes sense. So he said, the law teaches us right from wrong. But sin, verse number 8, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. So, I'll tell you what that means in just a minute. Where was this sin at that rose up? Where did it come from? But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, where did that sin come from? Somebody said something. You say it out loud. Even if you ain't right, I'll be nice. Initially, but once Satan allowed sin to come, well, we allowed sin to come in, what did David say? Did anybody read Psalm 51 after Sunday? He said, Behold, I was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Romans 3.23 says what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Where did the sin come from in the garden ultimately? Came up from her. Yes. 
But what gave birth to sin? Mm -mm. When the Lord said, can't do that. Can't do that. And it's, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But when the Lord said, can't do that, what did that automatically do to Eve? I want to do that. Ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. Trip ain't in here right now, but I was telling them, them about it at breakfast. Trip, ooh, that boy was bad when he was a little hard-headed little old rascal. He really wasn't all that bad, but I promise you, you would say, don't touch that. And he'd look at you and go, wouldn't he? he he'd look at you. Boy, make you want to pow. And he didn't quit it for a long time. He really still got some of it in him. But that's something natural that rises up. You can't tell them kids in school, all right, everybody, we're going to be quiet, be nice to each other, say please and thank you, yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. Thank you for your cooperation. No, they won't do it. All right? So sin, when the commandment came, that's why God wants us to serve him by choice. That's where all this came from. But sin took occasion by the commandment. Sin is in me. Yes, it is in your darling little baby. We're going to talk about that in just a minute though. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought or worked in me all manner of concupiscence. Here's what concupiscence means. Produced in me inordinate affection. A desire that couldn't be satisfied by anything else than doing what I wasn't supposed to do. That's why when you keep on being bad and you confront somebody about it, they say, I don't know why I keep doing that. Yes, you do, because you want to. Look here. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. What is that? My own desires. And unfortunately, too often, my desires are determined by the commandments in my life. Think about this. You come in with a love note from a knucklehead, and daddy says... You ain't dating that idiot. What does that do to you? Oh, I liked him a little bit till you said I couldn't date him. I just fell in love. When you said no, I fell in love. I'm going with him now. I'm going to sneak out. I'll break every rule there is. I'll eat. I don't even like him no more, but I'm going to go with him because you said I can't. Y'all know that's real life, don't you? Huh? Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, but my lusts are too often dictated by my boundaries. Why do you think it is? People have set their crews one mile over the limit. Huh? Because there's something. Oh, now. I, I see some light bulbs going off in here. Look here, I'm hurrying. For without the law, sin was dead. Meaning sin had no place or no power until God said, thou shalt not. Or thou shalt. That's where sin came from when he gave me, when he gave me a choice. Here we go. For I was alive without the law once. What do you think that means? Hmm? 
That means when I was innocent and I didn't know any better. When I didn't know right from wrong. When I didn't know. Gonna go circle town. Be home by 10. All of a sudden. 10.05 became. My desire. Right? As soon as you got a curfew, you was already thinking about. I wonder what will happen if I don't come in until five minutes later. Why? Why do we push the limit so much? Because that's what got us jacked up back in the beginning. All right, look here. So I was alive without the law once when I was in my innocence, lacking the education of right and wrong. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. See, when I begin to learn right from wrong, sin rose up in me. Rebellion and opposition and that natural inclination to push the limits. I remember, I remember uh, I was doing some work for somebody over on Pinnell next door to Sister Maria's mother's house. And Sister Maria's mother had this little dog in the backyard that was had a house and he was on a chain, like a 10-foot long chain or 12 or maybe it was long. You remember that little dog? I stood there and watched him. And the whole backyard was grassy. Except for about that wide of a spot at the very end of that chain. He had got at the very end of it and run at the very end so much that there wasn't no grass left. Y'all remember that? Huh? It's nature. It's nature. Go as far as you can. Why do you think we have to set boundaries? Okay. All right. This is some good stuff. It'll sink in later. And when I push the limits, I stop serving God and begin to serve the enemy. Exactly what Adam and Eve did. It feels like you're serving yourself. But the truth is you're serving the enemy. Now look here. And the, there we go. Oh, y'all hang with me right now. I promise this is good stuff. And the commandment which was ordained to life was designed, purpose to life, I found to be death. What do you think that means? Even though they told me it was for my good, it didn't feel like it to me. It felt like I was being penalized by the boundaries. Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down right now? I felt like even though they told me the commandments were for my good, remember I showed you that in Deuteronomy, they became grievous to me because they weren't fun. Because nobody else had to live by them. Everybody else got to stay out all night if they wanted to. Everybody else got to just take their mama's vehicle whenever they wanted. Just said, give me the keys. Everybody else got to do whatever they wanted to. But these rules, they get on my nerves. They make my life miserable. I could have a whole lot of fun if they wouldn't have gave me no rules. See, they told me it was ordained to life. It was for my good. God, you told me that if I'll just do what you say, there's that passage in Isaiah, and I love it. It says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the fruit of the land. It's a covenant. And Brother Shannon, he, I feel the Jesus in this place. He didn't give them all them rules just so he could prove he's the boss. He told them not to eat of the cotton-picking tree because it was going to ruin their life if they did. But they did it anyway. 
and it ruined their life. And it was an example, but it kept on happening and it kept on happening and it kept on happening and it's still happening. Okay. Everybody all right? For sin, oh, here we go. Oh, this is deep right now. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, taking advantage of the fact that mama said no, but I thought yes, and I went to my bedroom, and I showed out mad. Here's what I would say. They don't love me. If they love me, they'd let me do what I wanted to do. I said it. I even wrote a note, told my mama that a couple times. And I ran away to the backyard <laughs> in the rain. Because the rain helps them tears look real. Sin took advantage of my response to the commandment and tricked me. Maybe kind of like God didn't mean that when he told you that. He knew you were actually going to be better if you ate. Matter of fact, he's trying to hold you back because if you eat, you're going to be like him. Sin took occasion by the commandment and deceived me and then slew me. Sin took advantage of my corruptible nature and through deception, I decided what I wanted based upon how it felt and based upon how it made me look to everybody around me. How many of us did stupid things because it was cool? I, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I see that bucket out front. But how many people in this room that smoke or have smoked did it simply because it was cool. Watch them. I ain't never smoked. Me and Kevin, my cousin, decided we was going to start smoking one day. We was going to chew tobacco at the same time, but we was only about four. It didn't work out. We couldn't even get them rascals lit. But... And that tobacco juice will make you sick as a dog if you don't know what to do about it. But it's almost, and now it's sad to watch people try to smoke and they hate it. <laughs> Have we all seen it? Some of us did it. Until, until... It got its hook in us. I know I'm messing with you right now, but it's the truth. Sin deceived me. You know, I heard this week, 400,000 people a year die from the effect of cigarette smoke in the United States of America. Nearly a half a million people a year die from things. Huh? Huh? Yeah, I said it. I, oh, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here tonight. There's some wake-up calls coming. I'll tell you what I feel right now is I feel ashamed for a whole bunch of my life because I went out cheap and easy like a little old sissified punk. He didn't even have to work all that hard on me. He just convinced me that I would fit in, that I would be cool, that I would be popular, or some girls might like me. I'd do whatever. Huh? I feel the Holy Ghost in this place ministering tonight. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just are true or right and good. See, the law is not fickle. That's why it's so powerful is it's not going to change. The word of God doesn't change. And the intent of the law, which is to give me some standards to live by whereby I am positioned to become. 
Verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Look here. The problem's not with the law. The problem's with sin. But the law let me know when I was sinning and I did it anyway. Sin made that which was good and good for me seem bad and against me. Right? When I gave into it, it led me to deeper depravity and further hindered my ability to see and hear God, causing me to be led by the flesh and not the spirit. And when I'm led by the flesh, I forfeit my privileges of sonship. I forfeit my privileges of being a child of God when I'm led by the flesh instead of by the spirit. Verse 14 in the New Living Translation says, So the trouble is not with the law. The trouble is not with the standards, not with the boundaries, not with the rules, not with the order, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. See, sin's the ultimate issue, and it's not going away, folks. I don't care how old you get. I don't care how holy you get. I don't care how much you pray, how much you fast. You can be walking on water. And the enemy will stick his head up through a wave and tempt you. It's not going away. So I must recognize and acknowledge. Are y'all ready for this? I must recognize and acknowledge that it is my weakness in the flesh that empowers sin to destroy me. But my comfort is in the law. Why should the law be comforting to me? It does. It keeps me safe. It stays the same. It don't matter how much of this stuff is going on out in the world, in the Democrats, in the Republicans, in Russia, in Israel. It don't matter how much of this is going on in Hollywood or Dollywood. That right there, it's the same. It's safe. I'll never forget that night. It's safe. He told it, that's for your good. It's, well, it don't feel like it. Didn't you learn when you were seven and it didn't feel like it? And when you was 11 and it didn't feel like it? You see, my flesh, Sister Casey, is ornery. It always wants to push the limits. I want to always be at the end of that chain. It's where I live. So the trouble not with the law. The law's not bad. It's spiritual and good. The trouble's with me because I'm weak and I cater to myself and I'm, I, I like to make myself happy. The inadequacies of the law were never in what it was, but the law was inadequate because of what it did to me. Rebellion when I didn't do it, pride when I did do it. I couldn't win when it was just, I couldn't win when I was just checking off a list. Because if I didn't do something, here we go, Brother Larry. If I got to about number five or six on the list, and I realized I can't check it off. I'm done. I'm through. I knew I couldn't live this. I knew I couldn't do this. But if I can check it off, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> it's true. That's how we do. Look here. Let me move on. Let me move on. That's why you can't receive the gift of the Holy Ghost till you surrender. 
He won't give you the Holy Ghost unsurrendered. You can't get that gift unsurrendered. Why do you think that is? I was hoping you would ask. That's why we have to surrender to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the evidence that I have received the gift of the Holy Ghost according to Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19, the evidence that I have received the Holy Ghost is that I speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I hope you would ask. The Bible says, here we go, Brother Derek, that this most jacked up thing on anybody, nobody can, I feel the Holy Ghost, nobody can control your tongue. I don't care if they put tape over it. They can't make you say anything. So when we surrender that to the Lord, because whoever controls the tongue controls the whole body. And when I surrender my tongue to the Lord, it is a witness that I have surrendered my whole body to the Lord. So, Hebrews 7 and 19, I've been wanting to get here. Here was the problem with the law. For the law made nothing perfect. See, oh, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but i got to wrap it up. Even if you checked every box, all 613 boxes of the law, you still weren't complete. You still weren't complete. Why is that? Because we're ornery. Okay, we're ornery. Look here. The law made nothing perfect. That's why. Oh, y'all ready for this? That's why we all know good people who don't hurt nobody who don't talk about nobody, who follow the rules, and we wonder, how can they be so good and not be saved? Huh? Isn't that right? If, if you can be good enough, if you can be good enough, then, then all these good people, just being good saves you. Right? Well, the Bible said being good don't make you complete. Because that's what the law did. Law testified to my goodness. God, I don't know about that. Oh, yes, you do. I don't lie. Somebody stands up and says, I thank the Lord that God delivered me from lust. I ain't never lusted a day in my life. You're a liar. But just because you didn't lust in the last five minutes, you think you're better than them. The law doesn't make anybody complete. If it has, there wasn't no need for Jesus to come. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. By the which, we draw nigh unto God. I don't have time to talk about that too much. But look here. Here's the most powerful thing the law does. Are y'all ready for this? You know what the most powerful thing the law does? It teaches me that I need grace. It shows me how much I need him. Because without the grace of God, we cannot hope to make it to completion or maturity. The law is not the way to get better. The law declares to me where I'm lacking. It declares to me my need. I desire things from God, but how much do I desire them from him? I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to be used in the gifts of the spirit. I want to be a soul winner, but do I desire them enough to surrender my life to him completely? Which the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The rich young ruler in the Bible. You can find it in the Gospels. He desired eternal life enough to ask for it. He desired eternal life enough to ask for it. 
But when the Lord said, keep my commandments, what did he say? I've kept all of them. I've kept them all. And then he says, what lack I yet? The Lord says one thing you lack. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. But he wouldn't do it. He went away sorrowful. But Brother Johnny, he kept all the law. He kept all the law. But even he knew it wasn't enough. He wasn't complete, Brother Larry. It didn't satisfy that longing. That's why I told you Psalm 51 was so powerful. Because David got something the Lord was trying to bring that the law couldn't do when he said, you desire truth on the inward parts. Because you see, Brother Larry, I cannot lie, not steal, and be messed up on the inside. But the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, wants to heal me on the inside and it'll show up on the outside. He desired, the rich young ruler desired to maintain his status quo more than surrendering everything to God. He asked, then he had to make a decision whether to trust God, live his life in those boundaries, or do it his way. He decided to do it his way. So we have to ask ourselves, what do I want? Am I willing to surrender in order to receive what I want? Am I willing to surrender? For those of you that come to recovery, may I introduce you again to step one? Yes, sir. That's how I feel the whole time I'm teaching. I agree. Everybody's not that blessed, Kevin. But you go try that in school and you stand up there and tell them, I didn't do my homework. You know what they're going to say? F, zero. So think about that. It is right to acknowledge that we don't have it all together. But I'm seeing so many people in recovery get to step three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and even twelve, they can't get nowhere. You want to know why? They didn't get step one right. Step one says, I'm done. I got nothing. I, I say you you've <laughs> say you've kept all the rules all your life. Sure have. I got nothing. I got nothing. I want everything he has for me. We got to surrender to the principles of God with regard to holiness, gender distinction, adornment, entertainment, verbal typed or written communication, sexual morality, etc. We got to surrender to God with regard to relationships. We got to surrender to God with regard to our finances. We got to surrender to God with regard to authority, to anointing and order. I can't tell you how many times people have told me if you didn't preach and teach holiness and separation, I'd come to your church in a second. What does that tell me? You know what it tells me? It tells me that it matters. If that's what makes them walk away sorrowfully, it matters. God's standards are not put there to make us weird or to make us different. They're put there because they're safe. They're put there for us to have guidance and to be aware of what we need in order to put ourselves in position to be complete in him. Stand with me. I ended on a tough note right there. But it's true. Why do you do that? Why? You better have an answer. And the main reason I do it is it's safe. Say, well, I don't understand it. I don't understand everything the Lord asks us either. I don't. But you know what I do know, Brother Shannon? His way works. His way not just works, it's perfect. It's perfect. 
Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you more for your presence than I felt in this house tonight. I, I thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes from you. I thank you for these precious people that you've called us to lead. And, and we're, we're trying to get this figured out, Lord. And we're trying to learn to be more like you. God, you never went around holding up a banner saying everything that you're against or everything that you're for. You just love people. And you trusted the power of your spirit to change people. And we got to do the same thing. But, Lord, we cannot find false comfort in things that just won't work. They won't work. They were never intended to work. They were just intended to let us know there's more. They were intended to let us know that that longing that we have inside of us is not going to be filled by anything else. That God surrenders the only way. You want to be elevated, you go down. You want to be promoted, you get demoted. That's the way the kingdom works. I must decrease and you must increase. Help us to keep growing. I pray that this seed that's put out tonight falls on good ground. I pray, Lord, that your blessings are manifest in this house. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 10 o'clock Sunday morning, the elements, 11 o'clock worship. Y'all come back.